What are the hallmarks of civilization? The hallmarks of civilization are these elevated, ennobling qualities that recall what it means to be human. This music, I know the place it comes from. This is compassionate music. This is music that is sensitive to our time and our age and the state we're in. It's music that has empathy for the conditions we find ourselves dealing with in a contemporary environment. That's the hallmark of a civilized person. It's the hallmark of what we call the philosophy of who we are, where we are, and why we are. Emotionally, it's me thinking and feeling through the music, through the composition, which I can do better than through any of my other faculties. So Virgil, I've heard that when you were in France for a half year, you composed your record there. Being inspired by the architecture when you were walking outside mm. to find something that gets your mind wandering. Yes. So it is architecture and especially cathedrals. I mean, it's very complex, ancient buildings constructed by human hands. Mm. How does that reflect in your music? Orchestral music has layers that conjure up images, you know, more than just the musical experience. So these cathedrals in France is where I found some of these melodies, the inspiration. Being in the presence of these great cathedrals, this architecture, these works of art, just the culture itself was a wonderful inspiration and I could go back to my writing, to my orchestrating, and things would flow again, you know, because I would be spending hours and hours in the hotel room with my setup, my rig, and um, it was, it was uh, quite an experience. The biggest difference is, are you standing in front of a cathedral or are you standing inside it? Because I would think that it's a whole different, I mean, if you're inside it, it's all about silence first. And you're overwhelmed by the darkness and the light. And these are the layers that inspire me inside. The outside, it's a whole different thing. Outside, it's, it's texture and structure, more overwhelming in the, in the solid rock way. You know? That's right, and all this can contribute to the density of the orchestration or not. Just the quality, the, all these images that it helps you imagine. Yes, yeah, sitting in there, sometimes in a very barren interior at times, it almost transports you back to those times when this was constructed and you feel the sense of history. It's that sense of history which has a certain aesthetic to it, you know. It's an um, interesting combination. I find that very, very inspiring. It's something I hadn't thought about. I mean, I wasn't planning to be in France apart from having to be on this tour that I was working with. And uh, I find that 
The orchestra is part of that history though, so it's not really colliding. Because I'm using this orchestral palette, it, it does resonate with that rich history, these historical revelations, you know, being part of history, it really is. I may be applying it in a contemporary environment, a contemporary setting, but it still has that rich history behind it. And I think that's why it had this synergy with what I was seeing. Yes, well, we're marrying the drums, and in this case, the electric bass with the orchestra. I had the electric bass on this record as well because I thought orchestrally, I needed that support, that rhythmic foundation to support the drums and sit in the middle of the orchestra. I think that was quite important. And there is an aspect to it which is really defying what's been done before in an orchestral, in a serious orchestral setting. I'm not talking about a pops orchestral concert or a jazz concert. This is, there are elements of, of fusion here, of course, because it is a fusion, but by the same token, I was thinking more traditionally in the, in the composition in terms of a richer, deeper structure to the music. So more classical influence. A lot of symphonic music does have a lot of pulsating rhythm. So the rhythm is there. It's not marked as a drum set may mark it, but there is percussion. There are beautifully percussive orchestrations and um, I can feel that pulsation, you know, that, that groove. It may not be grid-like, metronomic, like, uh, you know, our style of music may be, you know, our Western, you know, pop, rock, fusion, jazz. There's a, there's a groove, there's a pulse. And I think that's what I brought to this orchestral application with my writing and the application of the drums. So it works. I, don't, I listen to the record and I don't feel like it didn't make that statement. If that were the case, I probably would not have released it. It would be in the, in the vault somewhere. So I was, I was quite pleased the way it evolved and finally came together. So you wrote all the parts for each and every musician. Yes. Right? And you usually do this in your solo records. In this life was also pretty much composed by you or is Yes, it... it's all written. I, 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 I compose it. Okay, so now that leads me to the question. How was the difference between writing for a little ensemble, a fusion ensemble, and now you have the big orchestra? What do you have to pay attention to? Oh, I just had I, I just the, the process is the same. I could only write what I hear and what I feel. So it, it was very spontaneous. The way I normally write is, is sit at the piano and improvise. So whether it's a small ensemble or an 80-piece orchestra, it, it, the difference is in the density of the orchestration and and the possibilities therein. I was so excited about the possibility of, of doing this record only because it would give life to the rhythms 
that I play on the drums, it would put those rhythms to the service of music in a way that was beyond what I was expecting because the rich textural layers that you can create to support some of the rhythmic ideas that I wanted to explore, but then give it another layer, another life through the harmony, through the melody as well as the rhythm. That's what was quite exciting for me. So what came first? The rhythm, the drums, or...? Nothing comes first. Everything comes second. <laughs> it's spontaneous. It's, it's, I don't sit down and think, okay, let me play this drum part and then try and write a bass part over that and then try and find some harmony. No, I sat in this specific case, I sat down and wrote at the piano. I came up with the chords, the harmony, and then you start evolving from there a bass pattern, perhaps, an idea. The drums were just an idea in my head. I had no drums. I was in a hotel room. I couldn't record drums. So it was the orchestration that came first. And easy enough for me to imagine what the drums may sound like. For example, the drum concerto, I would write the first movement and develop that, orchestrate it, get it to a certain point, move on, you know, let it flow. At one point, I think it was the, the fourth movement, the final movement, I heard the foundation of it. I, I wrote the bass part and the, the basic string parts and I wanted this melodic horn part over it. The French horns were gonna play the melody. I knew that, I could hear it in my head, but I struggled with that section. This was the peak. It was the final movement, and this is where everything was climaxing. So you know what I did? I had to walk out. I, I, I'm sure I struggled for at least three or four days with that melody, and finally one of the guys in the band said, oh, we're all going to the Eiffel Tower. It was a cold day in Paris. We'd been there about two weeks, and I thought, yeah, let me go. I've got to get out of here. And we went all the way to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And it's the first time I'd ever done that on any of my trips to Paris. And I got to the top there, and it was wintry, and it was cold, and big coat on. It was so windy, but I, I just felt this emotion. And as soon as I got back to the hotel room, I sat down and that melody came out. So again, the architecture inspired. Do you think about telling a story? I mean, uh, can you condense what a song is or a composition is with a few words? Are you thinking like that? Yeah, yes, I, I think you can. It conjures up images. And the title track, The Dawn of Time, that was an image that I had in my head when I started writing the initial introduction and I thought I see where this is going I can hear something here it was it had to do with civilization with the beginning of, of perhaps not time itself but perhaps a time on the planet when things were coming to life you know plant life um, perhaps 
the first microorganisms or perhaps the first animal life. I don't know, somewhere in our far past in our history, prehistory. And that became the inspiration for the entire piece. And therefore I called it the dawn of time. Another track that comes to mind is, is Requiem for Humanity. Um, and that's fairly basic. It's, it's just, you know, there, I was thinking, I was feeling there's so much greatness in this world. You meet some wonderful people, great people, so many people doing, achieving great things. And yet, tragically, there's so much despair as well. And this was like a, a call, a cry for humanity, you know. It's, I guess it's a, it's a wish that we could just find universal, a universal discourse that would just give us our humanity back. Therefore, it's a sad song, you know. It's a requiem. We recorded that in sections, violin, cellos, brass, rhythm section. We can find ways, you know, we're, we're professional musicians. We can create that emotion, that, that sense of interaction. The romanticism has been taken out of the recording process these days, more often than not. Of course, there are still the occasions where we go in, play live, but um, in any event, I would truly like to be a part of one of those Deutsche Grammophon recordings of the serious symphony orchestras. I, I would like to see what happens behind the scenes in uh, post-production, editing, etc. It would be quite interesting. Those records are so perfect. And the sound is extraordinary. <laughs>